Our second reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. And then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me must say to themselves, Take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one is about to come with the majesty of his father with his angels, and then he will repay each one for what that person has done. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the human one coming in his kingdom. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. After spending the last week with COVID, I hope you'll forgive me for recording this sermon rather than delivering it in person. Early in the week, my voice did this thing where, due to the buildup of fluids in my head and throat, it dropped about two and a half octaves. I rarely sound like myself when that happens, instead becoming basso profundo for a day or two. It's kind of fun, but I've had loved ones not recognize my voice and that can be disturbing. Still, I was reminded of the last time it happened. It was just before I went to seminary. I was working at a country radio station in Detroit at a grand event, the Downtown Hoedown. <laughs> As part of my job, I was expected to escort country musicians through campus marshes in Detroit to reach the staging area. The crowds were thick, and though my voice was deeper as a result of spending several days outside in heat, haze, and smoke, it didn't carry as far. I found myself standing up differently, straighter, making my presence known physically instead of verbally. I'm not normally an intimidating guy, but, you know, somehow that deep but quiet voice meant that people did, in fact, get out of my way, and the way was clear for the musicians behind to follow. It was effective, I suppose. So much so that my boss pulled me aside and reassigned me. Apparently, I was intimidating guests to the event. No matter how effective and efficient it was to clear a path, in the end, it was making the experience worse for the guests that were there. And thus, I had inadvertently become a stumbling block to the whole thing. It should be no surprise, then, that I identify with Peter in the Gospel of Matthew. He leaps in full of enthusiasm and is praised for it. Jesus gives him the nickname Rocky, uh, Cephas in Aramaic, Petros in Greek, for being the first to leap to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus says, I tell you that you are Rocky, and I'll build my church on this rock. The gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. Very high praise indeed. I imagine Simon the Rock Barjona felt like he was on top of the world, looking down on creation. That's when Jesus starts to talk about the traumatic and difficult future he's facing as the Messiah, and Peter jumps right in again. God forbid it, Lord, this won't happen to you. Jesus tells old Stoneface, Get behind me, adversary. You are a rock that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. From being named by Jesus as the rock on which the church will be built, to being called the adversary, all in the course of five verses. Now, Peter's crashed down hard, leaving a metaphorical hole in the sand. He's got a few options. He could dig the hole deeper, he could try to climb out on his own, or he could stay in the hole for a moment and wait to see what Jesus says next. Fortunately, Peter chooses that moment to actually stay quiet and listen to what Jesus has to say. All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. 
All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. In this specific context, after Jesus acknowledges Simon Peter's messianic statement and then rebukes Peter for asking God to forbid Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus is making the point that it's not about taking the easy path. And if you're following Jesus, you too will not be taking the easy path. It would be easier to puff yourself up as a follower of Jesus. Look how righteous I am! Look how holy I am! But it is much harder to follow in the way that Jesus leads us. A way of humility, of careful care for others, of giving your life to make the lives of many others better. Not of bold swagger, of self-aggrandizement, of prosperity and ease. Jesus' way is the way of love. Paul attempts to dive into the specifics of what this love looks like at many points in his letters, <clears throat> most strikingly in 1 Corinthians 13, but also in his letter to the Romans. Love should be shown without pretending, Paul writes. Love each other like members of your family. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the Spirit as you serve the Lord. Consider everyone as equal, and don't think that you're better than anyone else. You see, in the days of the early church, the world had fallen victim to an illness of spirit, an illness of pride. It's an illness that continues to affect us today, wherein one person may look at another and say, you are beneath my notice, or I am better than you are. Conversely, some people might look at another and say, you are so much better than I am, or I am so much lower than you, I'll do anything I can to get even with you. This illness goes against what God had planned for us, to be loved in unique ways, but all loved just the same. The treatment for such an illness is not a greater separation, hatred, even war. The treatment is instead what all of us need when we are sick, rest, care nourishment. Yes, there are times when physical isolation is necessary, but the goal isn't to be isolated permanently. Instead, to be connected spiritually, even when physically separated, until the illness is passed and we can be reunited again. When Paul writes, don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions of your own, but defeat evil with good, this is exactly what he's getting at. Heaping evil upon evil just increases evil. The only way to overcome it truly is to bring goodness where there is animosity. In other words, don't keep digging the pit deeper, but fill it in with good things. Just as we nurture our bodies back to health, we respond to evil with practical steps. First, we can forgive each other, offering grace without payment just as God has offered grace and forgiveness to us. In this way, we overcome the evil of resentment, helping to see each other as truly beloved fellow children of God. Next, we can seek reconciliation, promoting healing and peace in the community of people we know directly. This is like bringing Gatorade or noodle soup to loved ones, healing in both body and spirit. Lastly, we can continue to advocate for justice through peaceful means, just as Christ has taught us. This is a way of both improving the health of the wider community and helping to inoculate against the illness of pride returning again. Using your voice to advocate for those for whom society has decided not to listen to, well, that is a powerful medicine of healing goodness. Through it all, we pray for one another, not telling God what to do, who to save, and so on, but asking God to hold us together. In prayer, we listen for God's call, seeking the healing and forgiveness that we need, and practicing offering that same healing and forgiveness to others in our lives. Sometimes we need to step back and realize that we're looking at others as being better or worse than ourselves. 
And we need to hear God calling us back to take up the cross and follow Jesus. We may need a time of rest and recovery, or we may need to offer that time to others with grace and love. Sometimes that insight might come from others. Be sure to listen when others tell you you're going too far, you're taking too much on. Or conversely, don't be afraid to reach out to others in this way too. My friends, may you be filled with the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the healing of the Holy Spirit, overcoming evil with good in your life and in the world. Amen.